This is day four of this January 2021 seven-day Rohatsu online session. And we'll return to Japanese Zen master Hakuen, uh, who lived in the 17th and 18th century. Um, we'll uh, kick kick off this this Teisho uh, with uh, starting at a at a chapter in this book, reading from. Uh, it's titled "The Essential Teachings of Zen Master Hakuen," translated by Norman Waddell. <clears throat> and this chapter. Uh, the is called the difficulty of repaying the debt to the Buddhas and the patriarchs. And he begins, Buddha means one who is awakened. Once you have awakened, your own mind itself is Buddha. By seeking outside yourself for a Buddha invested with form, you set yourself forward as a foolish misguided person. It is like a person who wants to catch a fish. He must start by looking in the water because fish live in water and are not found apart from it. If a person wants to find Buddha, he must look into his own mind because it is there and nowhere else that Buddha exists. Uh, Buddha, no matter how many times we hear of the, of the the meaning of Buddha, one who is awakened, and even if we hear that it, it from the Zen point of view, it really means more Buddha nature, our true nature, our essential mind. Still, I think for many people, when they see this word Buddha, it's just it's so foreign, and it and it, it almost inevitably conjures the image of. Buddha figures, and uh, while th that in itself is doesn't need to be harmful, uh, it's so limited to see Buddha and in, in those terms. Um, it's just a word we give to point to our es essentially enlightened nature. In, uh, in in Hakuin's day, and uh, probably, but also certainly in ancient China, uh, this was the question that so many monks ask: is is what is Buddha? And uh, the masters recognize that no, no complete answer would would be that oh, it's this guy who lived twenty five hundred years ago in India. It's he, any, any teacher would understand that the person is really asking, what is this essential nature of ours? But even as I was reading this paragraph, this first paragraph in this chapter, it occurred to me that uh, it could be misunderstood. I think a, a more... Uh, a more common question, well, for sure, more common in um, Western culture uh, among people who practice is not what is Buddha, uh, but uh, what is enlightenment? And they're certainly related. Uh, enlightenment is just realizing our Buddha nature. There are all these examples of, of the master's uh, warning students not to get caught in this word Buddha. One of them uh, is Zen master Mumon, a uh, Chinese master actually, Yun Men, uh, Wu Men, uh, said one who, one who utters the word Buddha must wash out her mouth for three days. It's, it's, I have a similar feeling about the word enlightenment. Uh, it's very hard to appreciate that word as something uh, 
accessible to everybody. It, it becomes a kind of a oh, it so easily becomes a goal, an award that that, that you hold in your mind. That's the last thing we want, and so I. I I, even even while sometimes using the word enlightenment or awakening, uh, it makes me wince to say it because it uh, so easily can be taken as some other realm, some uh, future state we could only hope to reach someday when actually it's right here in our originally enlightened mind. But his point, of course, is the same. If you want to find this enlightenment, you look into your own mind. Because it's nowhere else. It's not out there in the future. It's not invested in someone else more than you. Question. In that case, what can I do to become awakened to my own mind? And then Hakuin's response. What is that which asks such a question? Is it your mind? Is it your original nature? Is it some kind of spirit or demon? Is it inside you, outside you? Is it somewhere intermediate? Is it blue, yellow, red, or white? Of course, Hakuin here is trying to uh, elicit the questioner's own innate uh, wondering mind. That's how she or he will realize this, this Buddha nature is by enlisting the, the uh, one's own mind, bringing full attention to it, either through questioning or through just sheer concentration. And Hakuin continues, It is something you must investigate and clarify for yourself. You must investigate it whether you are standing or sitting, speaking or silent, when you are eating your rice or drinking your tea, or you could say eating your sandwich, eating your pizza, eating your cereal, drinking coffee, drinking coke you must keep it keep at it with total single-minded devotion and never whatever you do look in sutras or in commentaries for an answer or seek it in the words you hear a teacher speak and that is not mistaking the finger for the moon the words are pointing to this nature, self-nature of ours. Don't think it's, it's there in the words. He continues, When all the effort you can muster has been exhausted and you have reached a total impasse, and you are like the cat at the rat hole, like the mother hen warming her egg, it will suddenly come and you will break free. The phoenix will get through the golden net. The crane will fly clear of the cage. And the phoenix uh, is this, um, uh, in, in East Asian myth, the phoenix is, uh, rises up from the ashes uh, to become reborn into a new life. Here are these, these images he's offering, like the cat at the rat hole, the mother hen warming her egg, uh, points to the, the patience, the steadfastness of intention and yes, again, the patience required to do this. 
single-mindedness. But even if no breakthrough occurs until your dying day and you spend 20 or 30 years in vain without ever seeing into your true nature, I want your solemn pledge that you will never turn for spiritual support to those tales that you hear the down-and-out old men and washed-out old women peddling everywhere today. I don't know what he's referring to. If you do, they will stick to your hide, they will cling to your bones, you will never be free of them. And as for your chances with the patriarchs difficult to pass koans, the less said about them the better, because they will be totally beyond your grasp. Let me pick up just one phrase here. Um, He's saying, even if you spend 20 or 30 years in vain without ever seeing into your true nature, it's never in vain. If, if, If you're doing your best, if you're if you're persevering in daily sitting year after year after year, uh, there are a lot of benefits that you'll notice. And yet, he, the way he's phrasing it is short of awakening. Okay. He continues... Hence, a monk of former times, Tao Feng Yuan Miao, said, A person who commits himself to the practice of Zen must be equipped with three essentials. A great root of faith, a great ball of doubt, a great tenacity of purpose. Lacking any one of them, he is like a tripod with only two legs. Now this, I would I would say, really is meant more for people working on a koan. Um, that is the second one, doubt. The first one is everyone, a great root of faith. Well, let me let me uh, give you his words. By great root of faith is meant the belief that each and every person has an essential nature that he can see into, and the belief in a principle by which this self-nature can be fully penetrated. Even though you attain this belief, you cannot break through and penetrate to total awakening unless feelings of fundamental doubt arise. And even if these doubts, doubts meaning questioning, even if these doubts build up and crystallize, and you yourself become a great doubting mass, you will be unable to break that doubting mass apart unless you constantly bore into these koans with a great burning tenacity of purpose. Now, I'll add some of my own words. So, faith. The great root of faith. He says the belief that each and every person has this is endowed is endowed with this mind of wisdom and compassion to use the buddha's words that uh, this mind is bright and self luminous but it is stained by adventitious defilements it's it's lack of faith in this it is usually at the bottom of those who haven't yet come to awakening they may think they believe it sure of course i'm practicing i'm here i am I'm on the path of zen i must shouldn't must i not believe it well yeah maybe mostly you believe it but fully? Are you convinced, completely convinced that you are endowed with this 
self-nature. For me, it wasn't until after that I realized that I hadn't been completely convinced. My faith was not complete. And we can't just automatically boost our faith uh, in, a, in, a, in an instant. Uh, what it takes is we have to, we, what we can do is grow this faith. We grow it through Zen practice, not just sitting, but carrying that mind, that, that mind, that seated mind into our daily life. That's how we develop and grow the nourish this faith so even if we feel uh, we're we're short of faith uh, it doesn't it's no deal breaker uh, it's this this faith mind as Sun Sun put it this uh, this is equally in all of us so it's just a matter of, of growing it. Now the doubt, this, this, uh, what what in Zen means perplexity or questioning or wondering, it doesn't mean doubt as in one of the uh, five afflictions of Buddhism. The five afflictions in uh, classic Buddhist doctrine is uh, desire, aversion, restlessness, torpor, those are four. And then the fifth is doubt as in the opposite of faith. Doubt can be crippling if we listen to it. That is ordinary doubt, the, uh, the kind that means more like skepticism. We don't have quite the I can't find quite the uh, word in English to make the distinction there. I mean, doubt, the Zen doubt is doubt. It means perplexity or questioning. The other one is, uh, well, lack of belief, I guess. Lack of faith. But this doubt he's talking about, this this element of questioning is is the the other side of faith. That if if we have faith, now let's let's make it and put it in terms of a koan. If we have faith that our our we are this koan, well this this let's say mu, that our very nature is mu, then what comes from that is the question, well, where is it? What is it? How do I reach it? How do I realize it? What is it? What is this? Who am I? It is this element of doubt or questioning that really distinguishes a koan from breath practice or shikantaza. Questioning. To, to tap into this question. This questioning, really, let me start again. The premise is that to be human is to wonder, to question about our life, our death, where we came from, where we're going, who we are, what all this is, what the, what the meaning of our life. This may not be active in the minds of most people, but I'm convinced that that it's there, it lies there, dormant, even in people who say they never consider such questions. It's dormant because it's diffuse. It doesn't have any focus to it. And so the job of the koan is to bring forth this this question, what is it, who am I, and so forth, that will focus all this questioning that would otherwise 
be diffuse and not particularly useful. It's like uh, the sun. The uh, sunlight, it's, a, it's pleasantly warm, uh, but it isn't until you bring bring out a magnifying glass and that focuses it and with that magnifying glass you can start a fire and that magnifying glass is the koan and yet even even with a koan um, many people i would say most people can spend years where the questioning doesn't really kick in. But it can all of a sudden. It can in an instant. Instead of it being just repetitive, mechanical, going through the motions, once that questioning grips us, then we're on our way. We're near the entrance. So faith, faith in, in our nothing lacking, true mind, true nature, the questioning that comes from, well, where is it? This was Dogen's uh, burning natural koan uh, before his awakening was, if well, if we are all endowed with this essential nature, why do we have to go through so much practice and training, sitting and sitting and sitting? Why is that? If we, it, It's our nature to have this. And then the third of the three essentials is perseverance, determination, to not quit, to stay with it. And to, you, to repeat his words, even if these doubts, this questioning, builds up and crystallize, you will be unable to break that questioning mass apart unless you constantly bore into these koans with a great burning tenacity of purpose. So I don't think there's a better analogy than uh, the, the one offered in the Three Pillars of Zen about the man who is sitting in his study, smoking his pipe in his favorite chair, stuffed chair, no doubt. And uh, all of a sudden he can't find his pipe. Now, he hasn't gone anywhere. He hasn't left the room. Let's say he hasn't even got up from the chair. But he can't find his pipe. No one's come into the room. It's just been completely quiet, maybe the tick-tock of the clock on the mantel. But otherwise, he then wonders. He wonders. Wait a minute. It was... Oh. No, not... Well. And the... His, his questioning is... Direct, directly proportional to his conviction that the pipe has to be there and his determination, his stick to to find that pipe is also in direct proportion to the faith. It all starts with the faith. Maybe a more common example that more people could relate to is uh, misplacing your keys you're, you're, you have to be somewhere, you have to drive and get to an appointment and what you can't find your keys. They, well, I always leave them right there by the door in that little dish or whatever. They're not there. Well, okay, well then I must have put them in a, in a, my pants pocket or a coat pocket. No. You look all those places three or four times and then you start turning things upside down, looking for those keys. Same thing. 
if you're convinced that they have to be there, then you will persevere until you find them. If you're convinced in this fundamental teaching that we, we all are equally endowed with this essential nature, then you will harness that faith and move on. I'll resume here with Hakuan. Thus it is said that it takes three long kalpas. A kalpa is just an Indian word for like an eon. It takes three long kalpas for lazy and inattentive sentient beings to attain nirvana, while for the fearless and stout-hearted Buddhahood, meaning enlightenment, Buddhahood comes in a single instant of thought. Well, let's leave out the thought. It comes in a single instant. If you're dwelling in your thoughts, it's not coming. It comes in a single instant. What you must do is to concentrate single-mindedly on bringing all your native potential into play. The practice of Zen is like making a fire by friction. The essential thing, as you rub wood against stone, is to apply continuous all-out effort. If you stop when you see the first sign of smoke, you will never get even a flicker of fire, even though you keep rubbing away for two or three kalpas. Let me just comment. This, hearing these, this strong uh, teaching can leave some people feeling deflated. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, these words, continuous all-out effort, well, I, I have to admit, I don't, uh, I don't make continuous effort. I mean, I go, I go flat sometimes. I just fall, kind of get stalled out in the zendo. And uh, well, of course you do. And this is natural. So I would just add that to Hakuin, Hakuin's exhortations: is yes. You will. We all do. We go through uh, periods that aren't very fruitful and can even be really flat. But then we come back to the practice there. The worst thing when we get stalled out is to think, oh, here I am stalled out. How long will this last? Or here I thought I'd put so much work into this and here I am. Oh, what's that use? Blah, 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 blah. No, it's no, that does no good. Fall off the horse, you get back up. And now Hakon comes, uh, brings us another one of his many uh, analogies. Only a few hundred yards from here is a beach. Suppose someone is bothered because he has never tasted seawater and decides to sample some. He sets out in the direction of the beach, but before he has gone a hundred paces, he stops and comes back. He starts out again, but this time he returns after he has taken only ten steps. But if he keeps going straight ahead without turning back, even if he lives far inland, he will eventually reach the sea. By dipping his finger in the water and tasting it, he will know instantly the taste of seawater the world over. Because it is, of course, the same everywhere, in India, China, the Southern Sea, or the Northern Sea. In other words, if we can just continue... And just avoid stopping, quitting. We will get to the seashore. He goes on, those Dharma patricians who explore the secret depths are like this too. 
They go straight forward, boring into their own minds with unbroken effort, never letting up or retreating. Then the breakthrough suddenly comes, and with that they penetrate their own nature, the nature of others, the nature of sentient beings, the nature of the evil passions and of enlightenment, the nature of the Buddha nature, the God nature, the Bodhisattva nature, the sentient being nature, the non-sentient being nature, the craving ghost nature, the contentious spirit nature, the beast nature. He's running through the six realms of unenlightened existence. They are all of them seen in a single instant. The great matter of their religious quest is completely and utterly resolved. There is nothing left. They are free of birth and death. What a thrilling moment it is. To awaken is to see into the nature, the nature of things, which is the nature of everything, all phenomena. In the Mumon Khan, Zen Master Mumon, uh, there's a line, uh, if you know at once that candlelight is fire, And you know the meal has long been cooked. As Zen Master Hakuen uh, would often warn about uh, quietism, succumbing to the idea that if we can just be quiet and still enough, that we've arrived. That even without awakening to our true nature, it's enough just to reach this place of rest and stillness. Apparently there was a, there is quite a strong um, narrative in Japan at the time uh, like that uh, that was uh, in which the, the teachers teachers who like that would uh, would warn about getting snarled up in koan work. And I plucked out a, uh, a passage here where Hakuin is snorting uh, about those who say that koans aren't the real practice. I'll just read here. From the Zen people of today who are content to sit quietly, submerged at the bottom of their, quote, ponds of tranquil water, you often hear this. Don't work on koans. Koans are quagmires. They will suck your self-nature under. Have nothing to do with written words, either. Those are a complicated tangle of vines that will grab hold of your vital spirit and choke the life from it. And then Hakuin's retort. Don't believe that for a minute. What kind of self-nature is it that can be sucked under? Is it like one of those yams or chestnuts you bury under the cooking coals? Any so-called vital spirit that can be grabbed and choked off is equally dubious. Is it like when a rabbit or fox gets caught in a snare? Where in the world did they find these things? The back shelves of some old country store? Wherever, it must be a very strange place. And then later in this book, again, he addresses this, what he would consider heresy, uh, that it's enough 
just to sit quietly. Oh, actually, he's quoting Da Wei. Da Wei is his predecessor, Chinese master, who uh, was the, preceded Hakuin centuries earlier uh, as a reformer of, of Zen. He quotes Da Wei, At the present time, the evil one's influence is strong and the Dharma is weak. The evil one we can just take as the, the uh, power of the ego. The great majority of people regard, quote, reverting to tranquility and living within it as the ultimate attainment. And then Dawe continues, a race of sham Zenists has appeared in recent years who consider sitting with dropped eyelids and letting illusory thoughts spin through their minds to be the attainment of a marvelous state that surpasses human understanding. They regard it as the realm of primal Buddhahood, existing prior to the timeless beginning, that's in quotation marks. And if they do open their mouths and utter so much as a syllable, they immediately tell you that they have fallen out of that marvelous realm. They believe this to be the most fundamental state it is possible to attain. Satori is a mere side issue, a twig or branch. Those are in quotes, so that's probably what these who dismiss awakening, uh, they're probably their words, just a twig or a branch. Such people are completely mistaken from the time they take their first step on the path. That's, those are Da Wei's words. And then Hakuin continues, These people who ally themselves with the devil are present in great numbers today as well. To them I say, never, never mind for now about what you consider non-essential side issues. Tell me about your own fundamental matter, the one you hide away treasuring so zealously. What is it like? Is it a piece of solid emptiness fixed firmly in the ground somewhere? like a post for tethering mules and horses? Or maybe it's a deep hole filled with a sheer black silence. Whatever it is, it makes my flesh creep. Here he's poking holes in this idea that there's a thing, any kind of special place in us or anywhere, that uh, is not our own mind, part of our own nature. It's very easy to to think this way. Um, I remember having this idea that um, if only could could uh, find this this dark, marvelously dark, mysterious place and just stay there, just just build a nest in there, then that's it. But it's, 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 it's a delusion to think, really, that there's anything inside that isn't also outside. It's a delusion to think that there's any kind of, any kind of substantial um, boundaries, uh, that there's any this or that, inside, outside, here and there, now and then. That's the mistake, that's the delusion that we we use our imaginations to create this this image or this make it it's vague probably in most cases it's vague it's some some exotic uh very special special place that we we need to get in and stay in it's this this here where else could it be it's this look around For me, it took the form of thinking, of, of, of fixing my my gaze too low. Uh, it's like I, in some vague way, I thought, okay, if I could just 
get into my hara. Um, if I could just find a way in, that that's where it is. No, it's no more in the hara, the belly, than anywhere else. It's just that in our in our zazen, if we can work from the hara, from the belly, um, then, well, that's that's our center physically. It's our center. It's our center horizontally. It's our center vertically, the hara. So it's just a way of getting out of all the trafficking of thoughts in the in the head. So if we can work from the hara, but not imagine that that's where it's at in the hara and not in the pinky or in the wastebasket or in the tree outside. Hakuin continues, Once a person is able to achieve the true single-mindedness in his practice and smash apart the old nest of Alaya consciousness into which he has settled, the great perfect mirror wisdom immediately appears and the other three great wisdoms start to function. If, on the other hand, he allows himself to be seduced, let's make it, let's use the feminine, why not? If, on the other hand, she allows herself to be seduced by these latter-day devils into hunkering down inside an old nest and making herself at home there, turning it into a private treasure chamber and spending all her time dusting and polishing it, sweeping and brushing it clean, what can he hope to achieve? Absolutely nothing. Basically, it is a piece of the eighth consciousness, the same eighth consciousness that enters the womb of a donkey and enters the belly of a horse. So I urgently exhort you to do everything you can, strive with all your strength to strike down into that dark cave and smash your way open into freedom. This... uh these references he uses to dusting and polishing and sweeping and brushing. Uh, this, uh, no doubt, he gets from uh, the those who practice this quietism and they and they with while denying or ignoring or dismissing awakening, they just say, "Oh, we just need to." Uh, keep the dusts from accumulating. This goes way back to this original uh, battle uh, between the, uh, well, it wasn't exactly a battle, very briefly, where um, the, the fifth, our fifth ancestor, uh, the whole monastery was challenged by him to come up with a writing on the wall to show their understanding. And the head monk came forward and he talked about this mind is like a mirror and we just need to polish it and keep it free of dust. And then, and then Wei Nung, who became the, later became the sixth patriarch, he said, there's no mirror mind and there's no dust that can alight. And so, he got the job of being the fifth patriarch's successor. Uh, there's this misunderstanding that uh, Hakuin uh, pitted himself against Dogen. Dogen would be uh, the the most maybe one of the most enlightened proponents of this uh, other uh, approach of uh, just getting free of this whole idea of an enlightened or unenlightened. Um, Dogen 
Dogen respected, or excuse me, Hakuin respected Dogen. Um, I found a passage in here. This is uh, in this other book I was reading from earlier in Sashin, uh, Wild Ivy, the Spiritual Autobiography of Zen Master Hakuin, and the Introduction, which is mostly what I read from. Uh, uh, here's here's what the the translator Norman Waddell says. Although the practice methods of contemporary Soto teachers come in for a good deal of extremely hostile comment later in Hakuin's writings. During his travels, he seems to have visited many Soto temples. Dogen, the founder of the school, is frequently quoted and always mentioned in terms of the greatest respect. So, whatever sect, whatever religion we are, we it's, it's we can we can misuse it, we can corrupt it uh, if we're not um, don't have both eyes open. The the uh, danger with uh, the non koan practice is that it be, you just can settle into this sludge of quiet. Uh, where you're you're not really engaging with the great matter of birth and death. The danger of the other, Hakuin, the Rinzai, the Koan practice, is that even if you you do awaken, use the Koan to come to awakening, then you can become, well, even before awakening, you become attached to the idea of it, it's a huge obstacle. The notion, the thought of awakening or getting through your koan, every thought is an obstacle, no matter what the thought is. And then afterward, even if you do have a breakthrough, then it can be the danger of clinging to that experience. Uh, we'll wrap it up now and recite the four vows. 